morning, everyone. Good morning. It's been a blessing already today. It's been a blessing to be here. This is great. I enjoyed every part of the morning uh, study as well as uh, uh, what's happened so far in this service. So, uh, my message for today is called Worldliness. Uh, this is what you're not supposed to do. Is that, <laughs> is that a good sermon? <laughs> Um, but we know the opposite would be true of what we should be doing, would be the opposite of some of the things I'm going to read today. Uh, we know that there's Christian characteristics, and if we were to list them all, starting with love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, and you know, so on, uh, there is actually 66 of those things that you should be doing. 66. Well. I, I've been many, many years ago now that I started looking for the Christian characteristics. And I found a, a study group for uh, adult lessons or something like that. And I actually had a game that had uh, seven parts with seven pieces in each part. So that's 49 pieces. And uh, a fellow in Oregon preached because he had been studying. Actually, he didn't preach, he was teaching these Christian characteristics because he is just a church member that drove to and from work quite a ways and he had plenty of time to think about more of the Christian characteristics. So uh, with all of that, he uh, uh, started me going with even more Christian characteristics. And some of you have heard me talk about it, but if you put on one side uh, humility and the other side you put pride, you can see how you can start filling in down two columns of things that you should do and things that you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> so, um, so worldliness comes in on the bad side. And if I can read a statement here about the uh, uh, about uh, what what we would say, what we could say about worldliness, the scriptures condemn worldliness, which includes the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. That's from 1 John 2 and verse 16. Therefore, a Christian should not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of his mind, so that he may know what is the will of God for him. His life should be an example to both believer and non-believer. Interesting. That's a good word to put it that way, that we need to be witnessing to the unbeliever, the non-believer, as well as to uh, uphold and, and uplift the, uh, the believers, help the believers to walk in the Lord. So I've got a number of verses that I'm going to look up, and uh, in the process of looking them up and reading them, it's, uh, I'm going to talk about them, talk about bits and pieces here and there. So in Romans chapter 12, that's where I'm going to start. Okay, Romans chapter 12. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. Uh, 2 is the one I'm kind of after, but uh, 1 fits so nicely, we need to have that one too. So here we go, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We can look at that and say, uh, he's begging us to do this. This is the right thing to do. He's begging us to do this. By the mercies of God, he's pleading with us to present our own selves, our own body, uh, as a living sacrifice. The Old Testament, they really knew what the sacrifices were all about, how many there were, and how, how much time-consuming effort it was, and what it spiritually meant, as well as that poor little lamb or animal that had to die because of our sins. So it brought people, snapped them to attention, said, do you understand what's going on, that this animal has to die? They even had to put their hand on the animal's head. Uh, it was pretty, pretty tough. So we should present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, oh boy. Some people say you can't do that. Well, why is it there? It's possible through the power of the Holy Spirit, not on our own, but through the power of the Holy Spirit to present ourselves holy 
and acceptable. That's the one that scares me, that I would be acceptable in God's eyes and that I would give him reasonable service. It's only a reasonable service that we do that, that we present ourselves acceptable unto God. In verse 2, and be not conformed to this world. Oh, it's so much easier if you go along with the world. Just whatever they say, whatever they do, just nod your head, just carry on, do your own thing, but never let anybody know that you know otherwise or are different. So be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Think things through, study things through, so that your mind will find what God really wants you to be doing and how you're going to serve Him. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There's a job for you. Just do that one verse and <laughs> you got your time taken up, right? Wow. If we would study and understand what is good and what is wrong, what to stay away from, what to follow to, to serve the Lord, what's acceptable to the Heavenly Father, what is going to help along a perfection that God alone knows exactly what it is. How perfect is perfect. God knows, and He can help us to know His will and to do it. Okay, go with the, me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. 23 and 24. And 24 reads this way, And that he put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. I went to, oh, 23, I'm sorry. I got it marked and I didn't read it. 23 is very short. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. We need to do something about it. We need to get on with the job and change our minds to something new and spiritual. Change our minds. And put on the new man. In baptism, you bury the old man. And you rise in newness of life. Well, let's see what it is, is what he's saying. Put this on. Put on the new man. Which after God is created in righteousness. That's where we need to be concerned about and true holiness. How do we get that accomplished? How do we work at that? How do we acquire more of that? In Romans chapter 8 this time, Romans chapter 8, let me take you back there to Romans. Romans chapter 8. And I want to read verse 12 through 14. I'll be coming back to this page almost exactly in a little while, but uh, let's go for chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 12 through, through 14. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Is it somehow you're in debt? You've got a problem that you're going to have to pay. If you do it right, the payment is different. If you do it wrong, the payment is everything that you own, your life and your soul as well. We're debtors. For if after, for if ye live after the flesh, worldliness, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. That's what we're after. We want to live in this. In verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And you can go on and read in this chapter and you say, Wow, okay. I get right with God. God loves me. I get all the goodies. I get eternal life. I get to call Him Daddy. He's hugging me. He's caressing me. He's supplying me. He's it's being a real daddy to me. Uh, wow. But the thing is right here that we need to get away from the flesh, get away from worldliness, mortify those deeds, kill those deeds. We don't want them with us. 
that we should live in a different direction, live in the Spirit, and we will have life. And if we're led by the Spirit of God, we would be called the sons of God, sons and daughters of God. Okay, let's go again to another place in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4. I've got little papers in here to help me go a little faster, and sometimes I, I depend on them too much, and then I get in trouble. <laughs> okay. uh, 1 Timothy, and chapter 4, and verse 12. Chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believer in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Whoa, how many is that? Let me see now. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Do you want to go on? There's more. Okay, you get the picture. These are things that we should be doing. We should be that example. Now this was a young preacher that Paul is writing to. And he's going to be the example for the older folks? Shouldn't it be the other way around? The older folks have been in the faith longer. They've read all these scriptures. They've been preached to. They've been studied in the Sabbath school and, and Wednesday nights and so on for many years. Shouldn't they be the ones that are the example? But he's telling this young preacher, he said, it's this way for all believers, really. For all believers. To be in the Word of God. Be an example of a reader of the Word of God. Be an example of knowing the Word of God. In conversation, this is not only speech from you, how you word things, but your conversation is built on. In the Bible, often the word conversation is your mannerisms. What your manner is. They're watching. Other people are watching. In charity, how do we give to things? How is our, our uh, humility or our gentleness or our kindness or our love? Uh, the only time it kind of changes when your son is just wee little and he comes home with this darling little thing that has died and you're going to have to bury it probably, but it happens to be a big rat. No. And you got to clean his clothes and <laughs> clean the boy down. <laughs> uh, but we should have a love that is different around us. Charity is not only giving to people, giving to causes or whatever, it's also our love, type of love that we have. In spirit, this is a pep talk in that kind of spirit, but also in a spiritual behavior in how you serve the Heavenly Father, that kind of spirit. In faith, how strong is your faith? Can you show others your faith? I could read Hebrews and figure it out, okay? <laughs> faith is the substance of things not seen. In purity, most people don't have it these days. The worse it is, the more people get in with the crowd. Yeah. Okay. And he tells them to pay attention to reading and to exhortation and to doctrine with laying on of hands. And you could go on. That's, that's a fantastic chapter there to read even further. So at least four more there. Um, let's turn to Matthew chapter 5 and hear what Jesus has to say. Matthew chapter 5. I want to read from verse 14. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14. Because this is a paragraph kind of there, or part of a paragraph on the one subject. Ye are the light of the world. Oh, are they in sad shape? If, you know, that's our job. If we're supposed to spread the gospel in light, showing Jesus is the light of the world, 
we have that light in us because of the Holy Spirit in us. All of a sudden it becomes our job. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. I love driving at night in places like Wyoming or somewhere. You come over a rise and there's the city all out in front of you, all in lights. Wow. Oklahoma's got that too, don't we? <laughs> um, are we that city? And if the city was set on a hill, it cannot be hid. Because you could look up to that city from all over. Jerusalem was up. Okay? A city that could not be hidden. And we're supposed to be that city. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. A bushel basket has, a, you know, if it's a woven one, it has enough holes that it would get air and it would burn underneath that basket. But what good is it in there? It's not going to give enough light to be worthwhile. Why are you doing this? Don't do that with your light. Don't hide your light. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick that it giveth light unto all that are in the house. That's the idea. Everybody can see with this light. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It's not for us to say, oh, look at me. That's, that's not the idea. We're talking about a spiritual life, a way to come to Christ, a come to a knowledge of the Heavenly Father, a better way of life. You could take a person from going downhill on life, and you can say, I can give you a tremendous life in this world if you'll serve Jesus Christ. And after that, it's better. Eternal life. You can give them all. But do we tell them? Do we try to reach them? That's what we need to do. We are that light. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, not to pat you on the back, but to glorify the Heavenly Father and to glorify your Father which is in heaven. Okay, 1 Peter. Let's go to 1 Peter. It's way in the back there somewhere, just before the little John that I love so much. Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and 11 and 12. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. Strangers were foreigners. Oh yeah, some of those. I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. Abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the souls. We're strangers in this world, we say sometimes. <laughs> Not really meaning that we're going to... Uh, leave here sometime but are we foreigners because we're different yeah very much so the scripture says we are different and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul if you could go down a list of lusts bang 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 and you say we got to get away from those because they're going to war against our spiritual life our soul Verse 12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, the non-believers, that whereas they speak evil, uh, again, speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. God's going to touch their lives. God's going to go around and touch them. They're going to hear something. Will they remember you because of something you did, some good works? Some people say, you don't have to do anything. You're in. Don't worry about it. This says you should have good works. You should be involved in some spiritual things. Okay. Uh, just, those, just those two verses there. To uh, abstain from lusts because that's going to be bad for you. 
Galatians chapter 5. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to start with verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. If you fill up your time and your life with the Spirit of God, then you won't be doing these other things. Verse 17. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit. There's a war going on. And the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things you would. There's a war going on. You're going to have to make a challenge to yourself. You're going to have to set goals, set standards, and say, I'm going to do it this way and not that way. You're making decisions because of that tug of war that's going on. Verse 18. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. I wrote in mine condemnation of the sin. Under that, under that part. Uh, this is where I'm wanting to go to Romans chapter 8. So hold on to this place and go with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans is a really, really neat book and you have to learn to love it. Uh, Peter said, Paul sometimes writes things that are hard to understand. So you've got to read it a couple of times. You've got to let it sink in a bit. So Romans chapter 8. I'm going to start with the first verse. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Did I go too fast? you got to let it sink in. What about the flesh? It's there. Don't do it. Don't go after the flesh. Don't allow it in. But go after the Spirit. If you're right with God, and the first eight, cha seven chapters say you ain't going to make it. <laughs> you can't make it on your own. It's so tough, so hard. The rules are tight. Some say, oh, there's no rules. Read those. He says, you can't make it on your own. You've got to have the Holy Spirit in you. And when God cleans you up, when you accept Christ as your Savior and turn over a new leaf, and you're a child of God, you're baptized into Jesus Christ, you're a new person, right? That, those are the verses I read. That's why this verse can say there is no condemnation, because they've been forgiven. They're gone. There's no condemnation. So if they're gone, uh, you need to walk, not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That's one of the rules that you need to follow. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. You know, you can't... <laughs> the law is there whether you do it or not, right? The law is still written there, still down there. But if you can get free of it, and the control of it, that's the main thing, right? You don't have to worry about that. It's, it's out of the way. Don't have to worry. He made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sent his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, for, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Jesus even condemned the sin of it, you know, to get rid of it. Verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, now, wait a minute now. You've got to let that verse sink in. That the righteousness of the law. The law is righteous? Oh, yeah. But you don't have to be condemned by it. If you know how to do otherwise, you get into Christ. You have Christ in you. You're not condemned anymore. Verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Well, get your mind out of there. That's what it says, right? Mm -hmm. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. That's where we want to be, the pro and con, right? 
the left and the right. We want to get over on the good side. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. It won't be. It's going to be foolishness. When you preach to the Greeks, the non-believers, they're going to say that's foolishness. But here the carnal mind is enmity. It's against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. That's why he can say all of that in verse chapters 1 through 7 and say you can't do it. Unless you have Christ living in you, you have the Spirit of God in you, then you've got it. You'll be able to get rid of the, the wrong things. This chapter is just good. I already read that little piece in there, so I give you some homework there. Okay. Study some more. Uh, where was that? Romans. Okay, now I want to go back to Galatians 5 again, where we had been. Galatians 5 and 16 through 21. This is actually pretty easy. So that's why he said there's, um, you're not under the law. In verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifested, which are these. This is the list you've got to stay away from. You don't want anything to do with it. Don't touch it. Don't get near it. So here's the list. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you, also told you, in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. We don't want to be anywhere near this. Because we want to be in the kingdom of God. Well, how do you get in? Verse 22. This is the opposite side of the coin. But the fruit of the Spirit. You're supposed to bear fruit, right? So this is what you need to be bearing. Bearing fruit. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Not against it. <laughs> there are laws. But certainly not against this. You can do all the loving you want. You can do all the joy. You can do all the peace. All the long suffering and so on. That's what we should be doing. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the afflictions and lusts. That's where we need to be at. You need to crucify those things in your life. Kill them. Kill the flesh with the afflictions and lusts. Verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us, walk, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Very great thoughts in, in that passage there. So I'm going to go on with uh, 1 John. I always love... John, I'm sorry, that's just what happened to me. I went one time to a, a summer session, ministerial summer session, and I studied 1 John and 2 John and 3 John, and I almost flew home without the airplane. <laughs> it was a real lift, a real boost. So in 1 John chapter 2, I'm going to go to verse 15. Verse 15 through 17. Love not the world, this worldliness. I'd like the world. I looked up the word worldliness and it says, you know, like you're trying to act like the world does. No, we don't want to be anywhere near that stuff. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So you have to have discernment in this verse, right? Do we love flowers? Do we love what God created? Animals and birds? And do we love trees? Do we love mountains? Do we love rivers? That's all good stuff, right? God created it. That's not this world that he's talking about. 
He's talking about the sinful world, the normal world of sinful people. Don't go there. Don't get into their company. Don't belong with them. Don't love their ways. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh. Here we go. The lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not the Father, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. That's our goal. That's where we want to be. We want to abide forever. We want to be in perfect harmony with the Heavenly Father. So whatever's going to happen, we're on His side. You and me, Lord. Here we go. Okay? That's the good side of life. The worldly things, sinful part of this spiritual world, the spiritual warfare, now, we don't want any part of the evil side of all of that. Because it's going to pass away. Uh, Colossians 3, which is two more verses sort of thing here. But Colossians chapter 3, and starting with verse 1. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. I'm going to go down to the 10th verse. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. If it's true, if it's true that ye have risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. When this was written, I don't know how many years after Christ, but not very many, 30, 40, 50 years, I don't know, but not 1844. This was right here and now that Jesus was sitting at the right hand of the Father. Set your affections, if those things are true, set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid in Christ, in God. When Christ, who is your life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. These are facts that are going to work. Number five. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, and idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. If we're not willing to do those things, we're going to Get God's wrath coming at us. We need to get rid of all those things in verse 5. Kill them. Mortify them. Because that brings wrath upon the people that are doing those things. The wrath of the children of, of disobedience. In the which ye also walked in something. You used to be like that. All of us. We need to remember that. that what, what are we saved from? Boy, we've got something to thank God for. Okay. For in, in the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. But now ye are put off, ye also put off all these, and he starts to give a list. Put off these things. Get rid of them. Get on out of your life. Move them aside. Get around them one way or another. Put them away. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another. Uh, boy, that one always gets me. They start talking about uh, people that are supposed to be a believer or so. But the, uh, the eggs at Easter time. What's, what's eggs got to do with Christ's death and resurrection? None. It's come from pagan practice. Where did the rabbit get into that thing? <laughs> they're lying. You go to other holidays and they're lying. They're lying and lying. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on, we need to put on, the new man 
which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. We have a godly knowledge, and we should put it to good use. We should understand what is right and what is wrong with good knowledge. Okay, uh, turn with me to 2 Corinthians. I wanted to put this one in because it's very fitting. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, 14 and onward. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? You've got to think about that one. And what communion hath light with darkness? There is none. Verse 15. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? With evil things. Uh, what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Non-believer. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. This is the real command that we need. And one little last verse I found that I have memorized when I was young, Psalm chapter 1, but I'm going to use just verse 4 through 6, and this will be my conclusion. The ungodly are not so. It says, this and this is like the righteous people are. They're going to be like this, they're going to be like that, they're going to be like that. Uh, in fact, let's read it quickly. It's very easy. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, and shall bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now then, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the, Lord, for the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. We need to choose righteousness. May God bless you. Amen.